So somebody was suggesting a railroad spike uh, That's fair. for the knocker part. I didn't, so I checked the pile there. I didn't actually see a railroad spike. Yeah, I'm sure I got one lying around here somewhere. I think was suggesting wrap it. Put the pin through the striker pivot, then drill the open end of the horseshoe around the pin ends. So we could go like this. Do you think that makes sense? Looks fine. Okay, Mike, I'll figure it out when I get there. Um, so I'm just trying to think about the, the placement of this. So this is going to come up and through. The closer to this I got, the better. But I don't want to, I really don't want to hammer on this end, even though it's cold. I'm going to flatten it out just with that. All right, good enough. So again, now you notice I can't squeeze it sideways because of the way this is aligned. So this is going to be kind of awkward. If I get enough pressure on it vertically, I don't need to worry too much about the tongue. Okay. So, if this is my piece, this is my horseshoe here, and this is kind of the wall. What I'm going to want to do, this is my, I'm going to have kind of a loop like this going through. This is then going to go through here, and I'm going to create my blind rivet. So, a blind rivet, what I want to do is I want to make the hole in it like this. I'm going to run my material through like that, and then I'm going to hammer down. When I hammer down on it, let me see if I can get that closer. There you go. So if I hammer down on this rivet now, it's going to fill this opening. But I don't want to overfill it. Normally when I rivet, I would want a big head on it like that. In which case, I don't need this to be on an angle. I could just go straight through and then this extra material would form a rivet. But I want this piece, this is my, this is my horseshoe. I want this to go flush to the wall. So if I've got a rivet head back here, it won't sit flush to the wall. So instead what I do is make that hole out like that. I poke it through, I collapse it down so I fill that hole, and then I grind off, sorry, I file off, pretend I'm an old school guy. Um, anything that's still out there, and now it's done. So this is the blind rivet. This is now flush, and yet it's riveted on. That can't come out. There's no way in heck that's coming out. So that's my blind rivet. So again, I'm just using the tongs so I can get it into a place where I can hit it. this over here a little bit more. So the Germans had a saying, which doesn't translate really well, but effectively it was two blacksmiths are one blacksmith, and one blacksmith is no blacksmith. So back in their day, they wouldn't have worked by themselves in this kind of situation. They would have grabbed an apprentice and he would have helped. So if you have a choice and money is no object and availability is no object, then, then by all means use H13. Um, if you're just getting started and you don't want to waste good steel and you want to use 5160, use 5160. If you consistently blow the temper on your tools, and you figure it doesn't really matter, use mild steel. I mean, you know, whatever works. So, as long as you know and accept the advantages and disadvantages of what you're doing, then it'll be fine. So, the other one situation where I will definitely scrape off the 
the um, scale is if I'm um, forge welding something. So I'm forge welding something, there comes this brush, and I scrub like crazy because I don't want any scale when I'm forge welding. So if you've got a whole bunch of scale on it, then forge welding will be an extra an exercise in frustration for you at, at the very best. See, this is this is why a lot of people aren't going to bother because that just lost its temper, just like that. You know, how long was that in there? Not very long, but the temper's now gone, and you've got a hole either side there. Yeah, so I'm just going to punch that out. So that kind of gives you the idea. You can chase that out. What I'm hoping is that you can kind of see what's happening there. If you can see how that's on that side, that's on that side. So there's a very thin piece now that should shear off if I kept going. So that's what we'll do later on. But what I will do is talk about chromium. So I'll say, you guys have all heard of chromium steel, right? And they all look at me like I'm crazy. Um, and I'll go, well, it has another term, and that's stainless. Have you heard of stainless steel? Oh yeah, we've heard of stainless steel. Okay, well that's what the chromium does. The chromium is what makes it stainless. Now I have a piece of steel back in my shop, which is stainless, and it's pretty rusty. <laughs> so. Stainless doesn't prevent it from rusting, but it greatly in, it increases the amount of time in which it takes to rust. It's inhibiting the, the reaction of that iron and the oxygen. Yes. Now as an apprentice, how much do you think you got paid? What's a good amount of money to get paid when you're an apprentice? And kids will yell out numbers that they think are real. And I'll go, well, I'll give you a hint. It's a nice round number. It's the roundest number. And then somebody will go, zero. And I go, yeah, the roundest number is zero. That's how much apprentices got paid. You know, and I'll go on and talk about the life of an apprentice. And then I can explain, OK, well, when they turned about 17 years old, the apprentice blacksmith was starting to get a little antsy, wanted to go out on his own. So you had to go to a different place, different communities, trying to find a place to work. Now the good news is, you would now get paid. Remember we said an apprentice didn't get paid any money. Well, now if you're worth enough, you can, you can start charging money for your services. The title that ended up getting settled on was journeyman. And that's because in French, the word for day, remember we're paid by the day, the word for a day is, and then you prompt the kids, and none of them know, and then you say jour. In French, the word for day is jour. And so you would be called a journeyman. And that's where the, the word journeyman comes from, paid by the day. And then the, the adult audience goes, oh, man, I never knew that. That's cool, right? And the kids, you know, and then you can start talking about the master blacksmith. I think I'm going to reduce that a bit. Say so now, after three years, if you've been working full time, you would eventually get paid full time. After you've been working for three full years, you'd be allowed to teach people. And what do you call, if you're a student, what do you call your teacher? You didn't call him teacher, you called him master. So now that you teach, you're a master blacksmith. Now notice, I didn't tell you you were any good. I just said you taught. So originally, master didn't master blacksmith didn't mean good blacksmith or great blacksmith. Master blacksmith just meant teacher. Turn around some more. So I want to. So it, it's landing, but it's landing like this. But I'd rather land a bit more like that. So I want to kind of. Convince it around. 
if if you're a blacksmith and you don't use bending forks, use bending forks. Bending forks are off, so use bending forks. So I'm going to over curve this, and then I'm going to see if I can straighten it. So this way I can hammer down this way without too much of a disruption. So the the reason bending forks are really good. Your other choice is to bend something over a horn, um, or you know, straight like this or whatever. But as you're bending it, you can't see it very well. If you do, it's at a very funny angle. Also, when you bend stuff over the horn, it has a tendency to walk. So you have to hold it on kind of a funny angle, and then hope it doesn't walk and all that kind of stuff. Whereas this is the consistent diameter all the way up. And I can see what it's doing, because I'm looking straight down at it. Um, so bending forks are great. So we're going to quench this end a bit. Again, if you're trying to make something curved, you can't hit it in the same place a bunch of times. You get a flat spot. If you get a flat spot, it's very hard to fix. So keep hitting it at a different place every time, even if it's subtle. See how I've got wider? So I need to correct that. That'll help me with my length a bit too. Now the traditional deal for being an apprentice was that you got paid nothing and then you learned some stuff. And that was kind of the trade. So I imagine there are a number of blacksmiths in Ontario who might be willing to pay you nothing if you're willing to work 40 hours a week for nothing. Um, but that's probably not the deal you want. So you don't really want to be an apprentice. You want a job. So if you want a job, different story. Now, you know, there was a saying when I was a kid, practice makes perfect. The, the new saying, at least in sports, is practice makes permanent. Um, so whatever you're doing, your body's going to learn, and you're going to do that forever. So if what you're doing is bad, you're going to be doing something bad forever. So that's not ideal. Um, so what you should try to do early is find a hammer swing that's comfortable. So that delivers power but doesn't hurt you. So if you are squeezing your hammer handle really tight, if you're raising your elbow way up to the sky, all of those things aren't going to work for you. I can guarantee you that. But are you going to ultimately prefer a two pound hammer or a three pound hammer or a three and a half pound hammer? I don't know. I don't know you. So you should spend about a thousand hours with a two pound hammer and a thousand hours with a three and a half pound hammer and a thousand hours with a two and a half pound hammer and figure out which one you like best. Who you might want to talk to is Mike and Megan. They kind of got started as young people. Um, and sort of built up their profession. You know, they were they were at the craft market in uh, in Milton for years. Sort of develop a, a clientele while you're developing your skill. So I want a nice reasonably consistent curve all the way through this. So you have to develop an eye for it. So if I look at that now, see how it's it's a bit too flat at the top there? Right? So it's it's condensed. 
So what I'm going to try to fix that, I'm just going to hit it here and here. Real quick. Even though I don't have a lot of heat. And that, having that eye for it is, is hard to learn, but, but you really need to. And again, it's just, it's just time. When I teach people, you know, for the first few times, they can't see it. I'm trying to explain to them where the problem is, and they just don't see it. And then after a while, they start seeing it. They start going, yeah, you're right, there's that nice curve. So that's certainly much better than it was. Down a bit. So that can be here. All I need to do now. Again, at this temperature, I shouldn't really be doing much other than trying to straighten it. Now this is why I love German anvils. So if I had, if I had a, an English anvil, I don't know what I'd do here. It'd be awkward. With a German anvil, I can just find the right width so that this can hang off the end and I can start straightening here. So there's my piece. So I'm going to have, again, my little semicircle going through there with my blind rivets behind it. And then that's going to rotate on that and then hit. I have trouble imagining that. Let's, I'll cheat and do it this way. And then like this. Only again, I'm going to have that further up. <laughs> I'm going to have that further up in the air so that I can land about here or maybe even here. So what you are going to want to do is make sure you've got a really good tight fitting hole through there. Um, if you can, you may not be able to, if you can get a, bla a brass sleeve around on the inside. So if you've got steel rubbing on steel, that's what you're going to wear and bind. If you can get a, a little brass sleeve on the inside of it, steel rubbing on brass doesn't cause as much of a problem. It's, it's rare that I bother doing that, but you can. Anyway. All right, so there's our door knocker. <laughs>